The sixth generation of game consoles were an exciting period for the industry as the new millennium had just begun with a plethora of exciting games on PS2, Xbox, and GameCube to kick off the new age. It was also an exciting time period for Resident Evil, a franchise that in just five years since it first released on the PS1 in 1996 had proven itself as a commercial powerhouse. I mean, by 2001 there were four main games, spin-offs that had already been released and many more were in development, the games got ported to several consoles and a live-action film was around the corner too. In case you forgot, since it's been 8 months, sorry for the wait, but I reviewed Resident Evil 1, 2, 3, and Code Veronica back in April and we're here once more to keep it going. Before the year is up, I will have tackled Resident Evil Remake, or just Remake for short, Resident Evil Zero, and Resident Evil 4. So let's waste no more time and start. Nintendo's GameCube looked as though it was targeting a younger demographic than usual for Nintendo, especially in comparison to the direction the PS2 and the Xbox were going in. But they did partner with third parties for more mature titles, such as Capcom for the new mainline RE games. Spin-offs like Resident Evil Outbreak were still released on the PS2, but the new games would start as GameCube exclusives. The console also got ports of Resident Evil 2 and 3. Code Veronica got an enhanced port called Code Veronica X, which dropped on GameCube and PS2. But the first new Resident Evil game was Resident Evil, a ground-up remake of the PlayStation 1 classic in 2002. The game was then followed up with a prequel called Resident Evil Zero that released a few months later. The director of that first game and the remake, Shinji Mikami, thought that a simple port of RE1 in the modern age might not be as well received because that game's presentation and especially its localization were not up to current standards. I was making this point in a previous video, but I'll repeat it now. The leap in technology from the PS1 era to the PS2 era was unbelievable. To be fair, every console leap from the 70s to the 2000s was pretty massive, but here is where I think you can see it clearly. In 2002, the original Resident Evil was only 6 years old being one of the earlier PlayStation 1 games, and yet, designing 3D games had evolved so much in six years that Resident Evil 1 was ancient by 2002. You could take relatively recent games and completely overhaul them in new ways. Nowadays, gaming has become standardized to where a game from 2007 only needs a texture pack, frame rate boost, and some refinements to the handling to be a contemporary game. This is not a bad thing, because that's just how standardization works. Every technology-based medium works like that. On the note of technology, this was one of Remake's most praised elements. Everything in this game feels so detailed, like a multitude of different sound effects for walking on different textures, the game even playing proper sounds from when your character has one foot on a carpet and the other foot on the ground. Visually, the game was supremely atmospheric with its use of fog and gore effects that outdid all the competition and darker lighting throughout each of its areas. A real achievement considering the fact that Remake went back to using pre-rendered backgrounds. Code Veronica was able to get a more dynamic camera by using fully modeled environments, but the cost was that the detail in those areas compared to RE3 was a downgrade, and playing it now, Code Veronica looks a little bland and blocky in many rooms. Remake perfectly blends the 3D characters with highly detailed pre-rendered backgrounds that also come with real-time lighting effects. After playing this game for the video, I felt like the darker lighting suited the mansion much better than how the PS1 version looked. I say that because I always felt like the remake of RE2 blacking out so many rooms in the RPD just made you lose out on detail in rooms that were full of it, like the East Side Office, for example. I remember that Remake also darkened the areas, but I feel it works here making the mansion and other areas feel creepier. You're exploring a giant opulent mansion built in the 1960s, so candle lighting feels more realistic than the bright rooms and hallways on PS1, and it adds to the eerie atmosphere. That case could be made for the RE2 remake as well, but I think the environments in this game were designed from scratch to look this way and have each room and area give off a unique vibe. Comparing these two isn't that important on the note of visuals alone, but the RE2 remake is one of my favorite games, so I bring it up whenever I get the chance. My main point here is that Remake looks fantastic for its time and still holds up now, and was a powerful demonstration of what the GameCube can do and how far the industry had come from the early days of 3D, as it's a night and day transition when looking at RE1 compared to its remake. Although now is a good time to mention that I didn't play the game on my GameCube for the video. A few months ago, I actually found Remake, RE0, and RE4 on GameCube at a local shop and picked them up because as I've said in many videos, I enjoy playing 6th gen games like this on original hardware as often as I can. I did sample the game on GameCube for a bit, hence why you're seeing GameCube footage right now, but my main playthrough was on PC. This is one of those cases where I can drop my usual anti-remaster philosophy because it's just the best way to play the game today. A lot of game remasters tend to mess with lighting effects and things of that nature in the jump between consoles, and Remake is a casual example of that. But it's good enough for me. The kind of differences only a hardcore fan would notice. It's remasters like Code Veronica HD where I have big issues with it. Unlike that remaster, the game also lets you choose between a crop 16x9 display and the original 4x3 appearance. As the footage shows, I picked 4x3 to get the most out of each screen visually. 
The HD version of the game, AI upscales the backgrounds and makes them look kind of smeary looking, which is something that I imagine would have taken a lot of work to overhaul given these backgrounds being pre-rendered. Which is another issue that wouldn't have cropped up if I played the game with the native resolution on original hardware, but the thing is, Remake on PC is 60 frames per second and the original game was not. Heck, the HD version isn't even 60 FPS on consoles, giving the PC version the definitive edge as it has the best gameplay experience, with some costs in lighting and backgrounds. That isn't even that bad, if you ask me. You can also download a mod that skips past those dreadful door transitions between rooms. These drag the pace of the classic RE games way down. Best part of using an emulator for the PS1 games and Code Veronica was just hitting the fast forward button to get through them. Remake and Zero having mods to skip past them, so it's clear that this is the best version to play. I'd be lying if I said I was ever going to play it on anything other than PC going forward, too. Moving along to how Remake is as a game, it's the same basic premise as the original. People are allegedly being eaten alive by monsters in the outskirts of Raccoon City, and the star's Bravo team was sent in to investigate. But HQ lost contact with them, and so the Alpha team's been sent in to locate them, getting attacked by monsters and taking refuge in the Spencer Mansion nearby. As the game begins, you pick between Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine at the start as the two have gameplay differences they'll get into later and experience the story in different ways. I had played Remake once before as Jill a couple years back and I thought the game was good, but I never thought about it much past that. As you may remember, my video earlier this year was my first time playing the PS1 version of Resident Evil from start to finish, and I really enjoyed it despite its issues. So going into Remake, now as a more solidified fan of the series, I was very curious to see what I thought of the game now, and let me tell you, this game is an absolute winner. Another topic I've discussed a lot in the past is that in video games, what a remake is can vary a lot. Some video game remakes are shot-for-shot -shot recreations of games you've played before but with more modern graphics, and in theory, improved gameplay like the recent Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon remakes. Some remakes merely take the idea of the original and try to make a new game out of it. Resident Evil 2 is an example of that. But then, the remakes I see people point to most favorably are the ones that use the original as a starting point and greatly expand upon those foundations. The holy grail of gaming remakes seem to be Metroid Zero Mission and Resident Evil 1 for that very reason. I think the best answer to what a gaming remake is, is something that's not set in stone, but is rather a sliding scale from an enhanced port to a full-on reimagining. What the best approach is depends on the project and its goals, so I've enjoyed all kinds of remakes that do have different approaches. But having said that, Resident Evil definitely deserves to be in the discussion for one of the best game remakes to ever exist. No better way to prove that than by going through the game and talking about all the ways it expands upon the original, which in my opinion was already a satisfying game of resource management, exploration, and suspense. The original RE pioneered tank controls, which I explained in detail in my RE1 video. It was an excellent solution for controlling a character in 3D on a console that didn't have an analog stick when it came out. A lot of people really hate these controls with a passion, and I don't know what to say to that. It felt pretty natural to me when starting RE1. Later games improved the handling, like RE3 adding the quick turn which made it much easier to escape encounters than it was in RE1 and 2. Remake utilizing all the improvements in handling the games had already seen, like the quick turn or being able to walk up the stairs manually. Not being able to do that in Code Veronica bothered me a lot more than it probably should have, but still. Glad to see improvements from RE3 back in the games. Like I said, a lot of people don't enjoy tank controls, so the HD version of Remake did implement a new control method. The game had several settings for controls on GameCube, but in the modern version, they created a makeshift analog control scheme where you don't need to hold down a run button at all, just applying more pressure to the stick to control your speed and turning naturally with the stick. I think it handles just fine and should definitely be more than enough if you really don't like D-pad movement. But while I played, I just defaulted to using the D-pad to get around because I thought it was more precise. When you're using the D-pad, movement is relative to the character and not the camera, like I said in the RE1 video. But when using the analog stick, you'll be going forward and then every couple of screens you'll inevitably need to stop and reorient yourself to keep moving forward. Not a big issue, but for that reason I just prefer the classic controls and thankfully Remake has that. Or should I say, the remaster of Resident Evil Remake has an option for both. Say that 17 times fast. I wish you could fully remap buttons to your liking as each of the classic RE games has different inputs to reach the inventory screen and to shoot and things like that. Fully customizable inputs would certainly have helped matters there, but you get used to Remake's default scheme pretty quick in my experience. Now for the actual game design. The one element of the original RE that stands the test of time would be its exploration. The open-ended nature of the mansion that saw you explore different rooms to find items to solve puzzles that allowed you to progress further into the house was a simple gameplay loop that was consistently satisfying. Even after four games, the Spencer Mansion's design from RE1 still held up as some of the best level design in the series. Remake had it easy in that regard because that element of the game was always going to be good if they were just going to do the original over again with new visuals and gameplay. However, the developers went the extra mile and really improved upon what was already there. 
A lot of this video is going to be comparing Remake to the original, and that's not to say the game isn't great on its own, because it is, but I think it's in comparison to the PS1 games where its new elements can be best appreciated. Otherwise, everything from the original that I praised back in April is still here and accounted for, so I won't repeat myself too much. In terms of layout, the mansion is pretty much the same as you remember, but it's been expanded to include new rooms like this outside patio that connects the second floor west side hallway directly to the main hall without having to go through the dining room's upper floor. Say there's an enemy there you don't want to deal with. There are many examples of new shortcuts being added to the area as you explore it, like the new backyard you can get to from the main hall. It has a space blocked by a gate, which you then reach the other side of when you get to the crow room puzzle on the east side of the mansion. Solving the puzzle opens this door that allows you to open the gate. Because of this, you now have a quick shortcut from the main hall to the furthest end of the east side where the door leading to the woods is at. So long commutes between areas are no longer a factor in Remake because the mansion has been subtly altered to include these new routes. But it doesn't take away from the fact that you still need to consider your approach. For example, the safe room in the east side has this door next to it, and for the first half of the game, the doorknob is wobbly, and if you use it too many times, it will break, and you'll have to take the long way around if you want to return to this spot. Can't make it too easy, right? It's not just new rooms that make the mansion feel more fleshed out, though. They've enhanced old rooms, too, like this side room that was next to the Yawn's Domain. In the original game, nothing is in here besides ammo and an ink ribbon. Not totally useless, but nothing important, either. Remake doesn't waste any space. In that small dining room, you find a page of music notes, and this needs to be used in the bar to complete the Moonlight Sonata music sheet that opens the secret door when played. In the original game, you just found the music sheet next to the piano, and that was it. Now, they've made use of an empty room while slightly increasing the amount of effort it took to get another item. Tons of puzzles have been changed, or just have more laid on top of what was already there. Like how you swap the shields from the secret room in the dining room fireplace to use the grandfather clock, exactly as it was in the original, but then you need to move the hands on the clock to match the painting right next to it to be granted the key that opens the Yon's domain. In the underground, I remember saying that it was neat how you needed to use the crank to push the statue forward allowing you to move it. I distinctly recall saying I liked that bit in the original review. But then in comes Remake where you have to do that, but then spin the statue around on this disc to get it in place with another statue in the wall. These aren't the most difficult brain teasers to ever grace the world of gaming, but I think it's great that Remake keeps in all the rooms and puzzles you remember from the PS1 game and expands upon them to make them take more effort to complete. This room of crows in the original game had you hit the buttons in sequence with the age of the person in the paintings. Now you have to match the colors of the stained glass windows with the painting at the end of the hall. I won't say one is more difficult than the other, but it's a change. I appreciate that change because of the fact that it keeps the remake feeling like it's the same game as the original, but it keeps players on their toes throughout. Take the jump scares, for example. They've made little changes to the timing that allows the game to still get you if you've played the original four times now like I have. The dogs don't dive through the window in this hallway immediately like the PS1 version, so their not being there was scarier than them actually appearing. But then when they do show up, it manages to scare you because you almost forgot about it. Opening the front door in the original triggered this funny looking cutscene that established that you couldn't leave the house, but doing that in the remake actually causes a dog to get in and you have to kill it with your precious resources, or avoid it for the rest of the game, giving you real gameplay punishment for trying to open that door. But there are plenty of examples of things you're familiar with being changed in an exciting way for veteran players. For example, I had placed the blue gem in this tiger statue like the original, but then I got the red gem where it was found in the PS1 game, but this room also included a new yellow gem. I had figured that was for something new I had to use later, but placing the red gem in the other eye of the tiger statue causes snakes to drop from the ceiling and needed to get out quickly. The yellow gem is required to get the MO disc from this tiger statue, and then the red gem is now used in this box. Another example of making changes is how you escape the mansion. Not with the various crests needed to reach the woods, but instead these masks that you need to put in the new underground grave that gives you an item to open the door to the woods. But it gets interesting when you actually do find the wind crest, but are unsure of what it does because you know that it's not going to be used like it was in the original. Instead, you need to use it in the woods to activate a puzzle that gives you the magnum, which is a must-have weapon for the finale of the game, especially as Chris, who doesn't get the arsenal that Jill does. The first time I realized that my experience with the original game didn't mean I was in for an easy time was pretty early on in my Jill playthrough where I'd grabbed the shotgun and activated the falling ceiling just waiting for the cutscene to play that would end the scene. But then I got crushed and died and lost all my progress from the first 25 minutes or so. Technically this was possible in the original game, but I figured I must have missed the trigger for the rescue and then decided to take the slower path to the shotgun, which was replacing it with the broken one in the mantle. Although, when I sampled the game on GameCube, I had activated the falling ceiling, and it was only when I tried opening both doors did the cutscene play, so perhaps this is what I failed to do before. Not sure, to be honest. But still, it sets the stage for my having to play more carefully in the remake than I thought I was going to. A lesson learned by the time the Crimson Heads appeared in the game. 
One of the critiques I gave the original was that it was pretty easy to break in your favor. Killing a zombie would eliminate that enemy from the game. So therefore, if you killed a room full of zombies at the start of the game, that room is completely safe for the next hour and a half of gameplay, reducing the tension by a great deal. Especially if you play that game on an edition with auto-aim and with the knowledge that handgun bullets aren't that useful at the end, so are best spent wailing on enemies at the start. This is something I realized after just playing that game once. Remake changes the dynamic completely, as the only way to kill a zombie in this game is by blasting its head or by burning it once it's knocked out. A knocked out zombie can't be killed by shooting it some more like you could in the last four games. My headshots weren't even that consistent when aiming the shotgun upwards like the previous games, so you're given incentive to try incineration. But to do this, you need gasoline and the lighter, which takes up two item slots for Jill. If you don't do this, the zombies will later rise up as a Crimson Head, a more vicious zombie that chases after you with its sharp claws. Hearing the sound it makes and seeing the zombie make a mad dash for you is probably the most tense remake gets, as you either need to outrun it or spend resources shooting it down again. This adds strategy to the early game enemies that weren't there on PS1. Now, if you defeat a zombie, you really need to think about whether it's worth making a trip to the item box to grab the supplies it takes to burn it, or you can just try and juke the regular zombies, saving ammo and gasoline but risking taking damage, but doing so because you know you'd rather contend with a slow, regular zombie than tangling with a crimson head later. The way these enemies are designed also allows for Chris to feel more useful as a playable character. In the original game, Jill and Chris were basically the difficulty options. Jill had eight item slots and Chris had six. Jill got easier access to the shotgun than Chris and even got the grenade launcher, which Chris never did. Jill got a lock pick while Chris had to find these tiny keys that took an item slot. Chris's playthrough was without a doubt the hard mode of the game, but I felt that he never had positives that outweighed that. The comments of my first RE video told me that Chris had more health than Jill, but I never noticed that because healing items were in abundance in both campaigns, and looking past that, Jill had more weapons and item slots, making her the better character to play as in RE1. In Remake, the dynamic is similar. Jill still gets 8 full item slots when Chris only gets 6. I got tripped up with Chris needing tiny keys over a lockpick because I never had one when I needed it, so I never got the backyard shortcut open in my run of Chris's story. However, Chris has more observable benefits that Jill doesn't in this version. To list a few, Chris shoots faster than Jill, making enemies easier to dispose of with the handgun, and his rate of headshots is higher. He also does have more health like the original. Both Chris and Jill can use defensive items to escape being grabbed by a zombie. Both of them can use these daggers you find to do it with. However, each one of them gets their own exclusive defensive item, Jill getting this battery-powered stun gun that knocks zombies out, but putting her in the position of having to burn it or keep moving. Chris gets these flashbang grenades that blow the zombies up, making it so they can't come back as Crimson Heads. But even if they could, Chris still has the advantage. Chris has the lighter by default, like Jill has the lockpick, when Chris didn't get any permanent items in the original. The lighter was a good choice for him because it's needed for zombie disposal, so you only need to have the gasoline to light zombies up because the lighter isn't using an item slot like it does for Jill. And while Chris doesn't get the grenade launcher like Jill does, and is forced to leave this flamethrower behind like the OG game, Chris finds his upgraded shotgun which holds more ammo before needing to reload. Actually, I went back and double-checked the wiki before speaking with authority on whether or not Jill could get that shotgun. And you can after Richard fights the snake with the shotgun. I just never went back in there because I got what I needed. So therefore, I missed out on that. But as I was saying, I'd still say Jill's story felt easier with the lockpick and two extra item spaces, but Chris had way more going for him than he did in the original. To the point where I could play either one when I revisit Remake, compared to the original where I'd rather not play as Chris. Everything I've said so far in this video are reasons why this game is such a superb improvement over the original version of RE in the mansion alone, which was the best part of the original game, but it really does get better from there. RE1's campaign was split into five distinct segments, the mansion, the guardhouse, the return to the mansion, the underground, and the lab. I thought the guardhouse was okay in the original, not as good as the mansion in terms of level design and puzzle solving and exploration, but it still had the same appeal, just in a smaller location. However, it was in the finale where RE1 started to get weaker the more it went on. The underground being too simple and was over too quickly as well. Remake really shines here. Starting with the guardhouse, or the residence as it's called now, a lot of this segment is the same as the original, but like the house, it feels better fleshed out in an area that really needed it. Achieving this in small ways, like how originally you needed to place a crate over this hole in the ground to block Plant 42 from grabbing you with its vines. Now there are two holes in the ground, and I had to relearn what I was supposed to do here as you block one of the holes and climb on the crate which has a crate next to it, allowing you to safely get through both of them or how you need to take this spray gun and use it in this hole in the wall to kill the insects surrounding the key you need on the other side. But those are just tiny additions that make the area feel more complex. When you get to the basement on PS1, a pre-rendered cutscene would start to play where you see a shark coming after you from the shark's POV, which would make any player feel tense, 
But this was shockingly lame as you then walk into the only open door where you hit one of the switches that drains the water completely and the sharks are left flailing about with no ability to hurt you now. When I got to this part, I was really surprised. It felt like there was something I was missing. I mean, could they really make sharks that easy to dispose of? The answer to that is yes. In Remake, the basement of the shark was completely overhauled as you get multiple sharks chasing you from one door to the other side. Shooting the shark causes it to swim away for a bit, but it might leave you open to another one. It's short-lived, but tense. Then you try to drain the water, but a big shark tries to get through the glass as you have a limited time to activate the machines needed to drain the water, then having to go down to an even lower area to retrieve a key and kill the big shark for good. It's part like this I didn't remember at all from my first playthrough of this game because it felt fairly obvious, I guess. Of course the shark room was going to be intense. It didn't stand out from the rest of the game, but after playing it in the original, I can appreciate these changes that make the whole game feel more complete, which especially goes for the underground which was doubled in length compared to the original. Everything about this area from the original game is still here, the boulders, the spiders, the crank, and the accompanying puzzles, but as you've come to expect by this point, it's received new content that allows it to stack up to the earlier parts of the game, including a puzzle where you have to set a box onto a platform that moves that requires you to go back to an earlier spot where the platform and box have landed. You push the box into a compactor that reveals a broken flamethrower that you need to unlock a door in the cave. All new content. The biggest addition here being the new enemy, Lisa Trevor. Well, the concept was created for the original game, but not included in the final product, something Remake was able to remedy. Throughout the game, you can find all these files written that give you more context in the mansion. This is true in the original and all the classic RE games. What Remake adds is the story of the Trevor family, the father, George Trevor, having been the architect who created the Spencer Mansion. You find his files throughout the house, as after it was completed, he knew way too much and was thus a liability for Umbrella, being kidnapped and forced to explore the labyrinth he created to try and escape. But that ended in failure as he finally reached a room he couldn't get out of which just had his name written on a gravestone. He was played from the very beginning and left to die. His wife Jessica and daughter Lisa became umbrella guinea pigs in the lab. Lisa in particular as she grew to be stronger with each test, becoming the monstrosity that Chris and Jill have to contend with in the modern day. One hit from Lisa causing you to lose like a third of your health. With this being a major enemy throughout the game that you're best off just avoiding that was never in the original at all. It becomes one of the game's defining elements that you have no idea what her deal is and become unsettled with all the letters you find throughout that allow you to piece the story of the Trevor family together. The entire plot of the game was overhauled for the better, although that should be expected. I mean, the presentation of RE1's story was just so terrible. Even the standards of game acting in the 90s couldn't save it. Critics slammed the voice acting and dialogue of RE1 pretty hard. I don't think Remake has great dialogue and voice acting. Other games in the early 2000s were a lot better than this, but it's good. Every character feels well cast, at least, and the delivery is consistently decent. Certainly good enough to keep you in the experience without laughing at the game's expense, which I think is important because by the time this was released, Resident Evil was an ongoing story, so you'd want the debut game to have its story be something other than unintentionally hilarious. Since I think on paper the plot of RE1 is good and interesting, it's just buried by the presentation. This is something I went into in the RE1 video. I thought the plot, assuming you didn't know what was going to happen beforehand, actually had a few compelling mysteries going on. And you wouldn't know what was going to happen to the characters in both Chris and Jill's stories. Now you have proper cutscenes, lip sync dialogue and all that, and characters being presented much better to back up my point. I liked this part in Chris's story where you can see he cannot read music like Jill can, so Rebecca shows up to help him with the Moonlight Sonata, but she doesn't get it perfect and he has the nerve to call out her playing, as if he could get it any better. Although speaking of Rebecca, I saw this cutscene where she was attacked by a hunter in the revisit to the mansion. I got kind of nervous here because I thought she was going to die and I'd have to get one of the worst endings, which I had thankfully avoided in my Chris runs of the original game, but luckily I was able to save her in time. As for Jill's story, Barry's ongoing shadiness was so goofy in the original game that you would suspect he was up to something almost immediately, Wesker falling by the wayside in comparison. But here you do want to trust him at the beginning, but he's acting too shady to be able to fully do so, leading to the reveal of Wesker as a villain, someone who's given much more dignity here than in the original, coming off as sinister and calculating, which I feel he was supposed to be in 1996, but once more, the acting and lines just made him seem like a real doofus. This is the ultimate life form. Tyrant. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Stop it. The Tyrant virus leaked, polluting this whole place, and unfortunately, I had to give up my lovely members of STARS. You killed them with your own dirty hands! You son of a bitch! No! Oh yes, dear. Just like this. Rebecca! Don't move! With the benefit of hindsight, the remake was able to work in details from later games to make the series' story feel more cohesive. 
Wesker holding onto a document written by William Birkin from RE2 as he's working on the G-Virus at this time, mentioning Alexia Ashford from Code Veronica. Maybe not something that had to be done, but the developers took that opportunity to flesh out the world of RE1 and show that the things you'd see in later games were definitely around when this game was taking place, like those games had claimed. Although, unfortunately, I still feel like the end game was the weakest part of the entire thing for me. The lab is an okay level in both the original and this, but after the previous three, you'd hope they'd do something exciting and new to end the game on a high note. While the rooms themselves have been redesigned to look more visually interesting, and puzzles have been reworked and all that, it's still pretty short and to the point. Plus, the final boss is still a complete joke. They decided to put the effort into redesigning this boss arena with the Tyrant, and yet it's still as simple as six magnum shots to kill him. When I play this or RE1, I just save all my magnum rounds for the lab, and you'll thus be able to tear through the enemies here and have more than enough to waste the final boss like it's nothing. The final boss might actually be the easiest part of the game thanks to this. Despite that, it's hard not to feel satisfied when you grab the rocket launcher and use it to land the final blow on the Tyrant, ending the game. In conclusion, I was blown away by Remake's quality. Like I said, I played this game for the first time a couple of years ago, and I liked it, but I never felt a calling to replay it, knowing I'd do a video on it at some point after I had reviewed the first four games. I knew the video was going to be positive because I already liked Remake, and I also really liked the original Resident Evil, but after having played RE1, Remake truly shined. Earlier, I was talking about what a video game remake even is, slash should be. It's impossible to deny that the best gaming remakes are ones like Resident Evil. This is a game that makes the original completely obsolete. I still think RE1 has its charm, and I'm sure I'll play it again in the future, but if you're looking for what the original game provided, Remake does it and then some. If you wish to revisit the Spencer Mansion as Chris or Jill, Remake has that level faithfully rebuilt with new areas, new enemies, more taxing exploration and puzzles, more decision making and resource management, and then it also has much improved later levels compared to the OG game. After finishing my Jill playthrough, I finally understood how someone might come to be disappointed by the remake of Resident Evil 2. I won't concede that it's anything below really good, since it's just such a well-designed and replayable game as I continuously have hammered home, but man, after seeing the glow-up that RE1 got with its remake, I do see why it's sad that RE2 and 3 especially didn't get that treatment. RE2's remake didn't make the original obsolete, which I always took as kind of a cool thing, in that both were unique and great in their own ways. But going back to Remake has got me thinking about how cool it would have been to see the sewers of RE2 or the lab faithfully done over but expanded like Remake did for RE1, and with the superior control of Remake just in RE2 and 3. When instead, Resident Evil 2 got entirely new levels based on the themes of the original which produced superior content if you ask me, but at the same time you do wonder what could have been if RE2 and 3 got remade like RE1 did, instead of going for the reimagining angle. But to be fair, I don't think there exists a timeline where that happens. I mean, we didn't get Remake 2 for another 17 years after the first remake was released. That can be traced to the fact that despite the very glowing reaction to Resident Evil 2002, the sales were not that high. In fact, Shinji Mikami says that Remake actually sold quite poorly when it came out, which I think is quite a shame as Remake is easily the best classic-styled RE game. Maybe it doesn't have the action-packed highs of RE2 or 3, but in terms of solid, consistent, streamlined game design, it doesn't get any better than what Remake offered. Thankfully, this game did get a bit of a redemption arc when it got re-released in 2015, as it topped sales charts and sold over a million copies in just a few months. Which is great. Probably part of why Capcom felt confident enough to make RE7 a more traditional horror game. But why did Remake fail when it was originally released anyway? Personally, I think it's got something to do with the GameCube's audience skewing much younger than the 17 and up the game was made for. Mature games just never sold as well as the Mario-type games. I imagine the audience for this game would have been higher on PS2, but maybe it was also franchise fatigue. Some critics did mention the tank controls and fixed angles as something they weren't fond of with Remake, with plenty of games going full third person, maybe it seemed a little outdated. Maybe it's both combined. What we do know is that Mikami said that the perceived failure of Remake had inspired him to want to do something much different for Resident Evil 4, which was still in development at this time, compared to the classic horror style they had in mind which is a story for another day. But that's not the next video, as Resident Evil Zero released a few months later in 2002, and will be the final fixed-camera, tank-controlled RE game before RE4 released in 2005 and changed the series and the gaming industry forever. So having said that, I hope you're looking forward to those videos, as I've never played Zero before and hear that it's not that good, apparently. But we'll see what I think. Then I can finally talk about RE4, which is one of my favorite games. And in the meantime, I'll say what I always do. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.